As I told you in the last episode of the Q&A, there were so many questions that I had to split up the videos. And this is the second part of maybe three parts overall. Hi, my name is Boris Mono, I'm a film editor based in Hamburg, Germany. And this is the second part of the Q&A. So the first question is, does being a professional editor make you a better shooter or vice versa? As an editor, you usually have more or less the edit in your head or you already know how you want to edit, um, which cutaways you need, what kind of b-roll you need, what kind of um, framing sizes are important for the edit. So there are some instances where if I have a commercial job lined up, a director might call me before he goes to the shooting and ask me, okay, can we go over the storyboard? And um, then we discuss, okay, which framing sizes he actually needs to shoot, if it's sufficient enough to have like a wide shot and a close-up, or what type of B-roll he might need to shoot as well. So I would say that it helps a lot to be an editor in terms of shooting, because you actually know what you might need in the edit and therefore you can skip or need to shoot. So I would say it helps a lot to be a film editor if you want to shoot something. Hey Bo, what is your YouTube video workflow like from concept through uploading? Many people have asked me about my workflow and I've been promising to do a workflow video for a couple of weeks or months. Um, I have been postponing that video because uh, it is. I want to go into it with so much detail that I haven't really gotten into doing it, but I, I will tell you of course now as good as and fast as possible what my workflow is like. Usually when I get a product or a video idea, I do some bullet points of all the, of all the topics that I want to go over in the video. Then I take a look at all those bullet points and then I sort them through in a concise order that is entertaining enough as soon as I um, script it. Afterwards, I script the whole text for the video and as soon as I got the script done, I'm gonna do the voiceovers and then I'm gonna um, I take all of that voiceover into uh, Premiere Pro and I'm editing the voiceover to a length that I feel is appropriate and that doesn't get boring or doesn't have any length in it. Then I during the scripting process, I already marked down which sentences I want to record in front of the camera. Then I record all the sentences that I want to have in front of the camera. I usually actually memorize all those sentences and then I, during the recording I might improvise a little bit and change it up. As I told you in the first episode of this Q&A, I'm not really... Um, let's say comfortable or I haven't practiced a lot free speaking in front of the camera. This is actually the second time that I ever do some free speaking in front of the camera. Yeah, and then I memorize all that stuff, record that uh, on camera and then afterwards I edit all those clips into my voiceover. Then I start shooting all the b-roll of the bag, the um, wallet or whatever I'm currently working on and I'm gonna edit all those uh, clips into my already existing voiceover edit. Afterwards, I'm doing the color grading inside of Adobe Premiere. I'm using LUTs from James Miller. Basically, you have a couple of, um, I do an adjustment layer over my edit, and there I include the, the LUT, which gives an overall basic look over the uh, over the whole uh, timeline and then underneath I'm gonna do some adjustment layers where I um, adjust exposure, maybe some color um, corrections and stuff like that. I also include some sharpening. Afterwards I mark where I need to put in some graphics or animations and stuff like that and I export the whole timeline into an Apple ProRes uh, file. I realized that I can just mark everything and then output it or send it over to After Effects, but that usually results, at least on my slow computer, in a lot of rendering time that 
makes everything a little bit slower. Therefore, I always export that graded footage into a QuickTime file uh, in Apple ProRes. And I import that Apple ProRes file into After Effects with all the markers. And then I include all the graphics, um, logos and stuff like that. Export it um, afterwards again into an Apple ProRes file, which then again I convert into um, H.264 QuickTime that gets uploaded to YouTube. And yeah, that's about uh, my workflow from front to end when I do some YouTube um, videos. I wanted to ask you if you'll ever give us a tour of your studio. Really like the way you put up the artwork on the walls. Would be both interesting and insightful, I think. The studio is actually not really big. It actually, it's just my living room. I have one lamp. I'm gonna do some B-roll of the lamp here. It's a really cheap lamp. Um, unfortunately, it's not daylight. Um, so right now you have like mixed lighting of the window and the uh, lamp with the softbox. Then I have a Sony Alpha 6300 with a Rode uh, video link uh, mic. I use a Rode Procaster for the voiceover and the Video Mic Pro for a very old Video Mic Pro for the B-roll footage. And the artwork on the walls here, yeah, the lion is a painting I bought in Bali. So unfortunately you can't order it from uh, online or anything. You actually have to go to Bali to get it. Yeah, some pictures from a manga you probably know, Akira. Yeah, the fox is a realistic interpretation of the N64 video game Star Fox. Um, I bought it from society6.com, I think, yeah. And yeah, that's about it, it's not, it's not a real studio, it's just my living room. What camera are you primarily using for making these videos? Why are your videos so outstandingly good looking? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, every video you upload is an eye candy. I know this is your profession, but still, I don't know many small YouTube channels with content so vis visually pleasing. And third, are you from Indonesia? Thank you very much for uh, that Great compliment. Um, I'm really overwhelmed that all you guys really like the content. To answer your first question, yes, it's the Sony Alpha 6... Th oh, that's a really difficult word. 6300 with the kit lens, uh, the 16 to 50 millimeter. It is probably not the best lens, but it's really good for my uses. It's really small, I can take it everywhere, and the image quality is good enough for the YouTube videos that I do. I wouldn't use it for commercial shoots, but for traveling, YouTube, and etc., it's perfect. Why are your videos so outstanding and good looking? Again, thank you very much. Um, I think you're probably uh, referring to the, to the grading. As I said in the question before, I, used to, I just use a LUT. LUT is uh, the abbreviation for look up table, um, which in the film industry or in the post-production of film is probably relatable to a preset in the photo world. And this lot is from Dave Miller and it's exactly made for the S-Log2 footage that the camera produced. And the third question, are you from Indonesia? Yes, um, watch the first episode of this uh, Q&A. My parents are both Indonesian but I was born and raised in Germany. Why do you choose Avid over Premiere Pro? Avid and Premiere Pro are both editing software. Avid is, has been around a little bit longer than any other editing software that I know. I mean, there are a lot of uh, editing softwares like Final Cut, Adobe Premiere, Sony Vegas, Avid Media Composer. And Avid Media Composer is basically one of the oldest um, editing software and has kind of been overtaken by uh, software like Adobe Premiere Pro. The main reason for me or the main reason why lots of film production companies and post-production companies in Germany at least, but also in, in Hollywood, use Avid uh, Media Composer over Adobe Premiere is that 
in my opinion, it is a more substantial and more um, capa capable tool in terms of editing. Adobe Premiere and Final Cut are kind of like Swiss Army knives. They can do a lot. You can do a lot of compose, uh, compositioning stuff like animations and uh, the grading is a little bit more easier in Adobe Premiere in my opinion. And you can do a lot of stuff with it, but as soon as you can do too much, there's also the possibility of including a lot of failures and a lot of things that can go wrong or some things that, that don't work as good as if you have just a tool. Like for instance, you can, obviously you can like do a lot of stuff with a Swiss Army knife, but you wouldn't build a house with a Swiss Army knife. You would take a hammer to build a house or a proper tool, but you know that with a hammer you can do like cutting and stuff like that, that you could do with a Swiss Army knife. So Adobe Premiere for me is a tool that that's probably also the reason why lots of YouTubers use it. You can do almost everything within Adobe Premiere. You can edit, finish and export in Adobe Premiere. Avid on the other side is... You can also do all that stuff, but it's really, really good when it comes to editing. When you edit in that stuff, like if you have to um, sync audio to video, which all the bigger uh, cameras, for instance, uh, don't have, usually don't have uh, audio uh, input, which is why you need to record audio and video separately and then sync it up inside the editing uh, software. And for me, I have learned that the old way with the sync clap and everything, it is way easier with an Avid um, than in Adobe Premiere. Of course, in Adobe Premiere it is easier, you can just take the reference sound and uh, the uh, recorded sound and sync it up with one button. But I have seen so many instances where my assistant editor or who else uh, did it, they did it that way and it just didn't work. So I had to resync everything by hand and in Adobe Premiere it's not that easy like in Avid. Yeah, and editing in Avid is so much faster if you have a lot of footage because the shortcuts are a little bit more thought out. But on the other hand, like as soon as you have to include effects or anything like that, Adobe Premiere wins hands down. But if it's just editing, Avid uh, Media Composer is better in my opinion. What do you need to be a film editor? Is it important to go to university? And how is it possible to start as a freelance editor, maybe part-time to a full job? Yeah, check out the uh, first episode of this Q&A where I explained my uh, history of becoming a freelance editor. Basically, I've never went to university or did uh, studying on film. I rather am a self-made uh, film editor, if you will. I went through a couple of internships and have been working uh, full-time as an editor for seven to eight years, I think and afterwards I went freelance. My advice would always be, of course you can go to university for it, but it's good to be uh, employed first in a film production company or in a post-production house, so you learn all the basics. Maybe have a mentor who is uh, a senior editor in that company who can teach you a lot of stuff. And furthermore, it's a great opportunity to get to know all the clients, all the directors and build up a network before you start going freelance. Because obviously if they, the people don't know you, they won't hire you or they won't trust you as much as, as if you are employed in a big company and then start networking, getting to know all the people and start building trust. So yeah, my advice would be go to a post-production house first be full-time employed and learn all the basics, do some small um, projects, not jobs. Obviously, if you're full-time, you can have a side job, but you can like get a camera, do some filming on your own, um, do some small films and uh, start editing, start doing your own stuff. And editing commercials actually helps you a lot in terms of storytelling because commercials are really restricted to 10, 15, 20 or 30 seconds. Sometimes 
45 or 60 seconds. And if you restrict yourself to editing short stories, it really helps you to think about, okay, which shots are actually important to edit in? How long are they supposed to be inside the edit? Yeah, that's a good way to learn. Can you do a video on how you set up your tripod when you record the product from above? Are you going to get the new MacBook Pro? Instead of items on Carryology, have you thought of looking into reviewing other everyday items? Okay, that's a lot of questions. Let's start with number one. It's pretty easy actually. I just uh, put the camera on the tripod with both legs in front so I can like tilt it on those both legs. I tilt the tripod and the camera to the position above the, um, the item and then I just move the whole tripod back on its uh, third leg. That's all I do actually. It's um, also the reason why it's a little bit shaky. You can use a rubber band and just pull the rubber band uh, on the tripod and then just pull on the rubber band to give it some more steady uh, pullback but I usually just do it by hand. The second question, are you going to get a new MacBook Pro? I don't think so. I'm actually quite unhappy with the way uh, Apple is currently handling the hardware situation for all the professionals. When I started in the film industry, everyone was on Mac. So I started with Mac OS 8, I think, on, uh, on those old Mac Pros. Those, uh, they were a little bit translucent and had those um, colorful stuff around it. Yeah, and I think the new MacBook Pro is really disappointing for a lot of uh, Pro users. I understand why the move to USB-C is important or future-proof, but in terms of professional workflows where you are on set and you get like a hard drive with USB-A connections. Having to add a lot of dongles to it um, is really, really, really difficult. Especially if you consider those USB-3 uh, connections are great. They are great that, yet, that they are reversible, but they are so small and fragile, uh, a small bump against it and the connection gets lost because, yeah, USB-A is just way more robust in terms of like, okay, a bump against it on the set and the connection doesn't get loose. Furthermore, the Mac uh, lock is such a godsend when you're on set. There's so many times someone is tripping on your cable and now it, your MacBook Pro will just go flying about if you don't, if you aren't careful. The next thing is for YouTubers and video creators, not having an SD card slot yeah, it's kind of a bummer. Furthermore, I don't think that the, um, the touch bar thingy is really useful. I, I really like the tactical feel of the function buttons. I use them quite a lot when editing. I have like, on F1, I have uh, my transitions. On F3, I have um, rendering. Of F4 is um, delete and effect, etc. So I use the F keys a lot. So. I'm not sure if I upgrade, I want to upgrade. I actually am contemplating about moving to PC, but there's one major reason why I don't move to PC yet, and it's because Apple doesn't license out encoding of Apple ProRes. Uh, you can decode Apple ProRes on a PC, but you can't create Apple ProRes files, uh, which is really, really important for me. Apple ProRes is such a good uh, codec for archiving stuff or doing intermediate files when editing. And many post-production houses in Germany actually use Apple ProRes 444 for um, storing their master files and everything. So that's the reason why I currently don't want to move to PC. So unless the next MacBook Pro isn't convincing me of um, being at least decent enough that I can think of using it in the field or something, I might switch to PC, but I don't know yet. Instead of items on Carryology, have you thought of looking into reviewing other everyday items like boards and foldable bicycles? Yes, I want to review more items besides bags um, and 
Yeah, I obviously do. Maybe I've seen the headphone reviews or wallet re uh, okay, wallets are also carryology, but um, I would love to review more tech stuff, but I realize that there are so many tech reviewers and the, the tech review space on YouTube is already quite saturated, so um, but I would love to review other stuff as well. As soon as I have a motorbike, I might do some videos on that. Um, not like reviewing because I have no clue about that stuff, but maybe just taking you with me along, like learning stuff about it. Like the same like Bowler and Survival, maybe have something like Bowler and something else. So that's something I was contemplating about because I would love to like venture in more different categories. So I think we cut it at this point um, because this video is already quite long. Um, I was rambling quite a lot because I like this uh, workflow and this post-production stuff so much. But there are still lots of questions left, so there will be uh, part three of the Q&A. Yeah, I hope that you liked it. and. As I said in the last video, usually I would ask you to put some more questions into the comment section, but there are still so many questions. So click the like button if you enjoyed this video and please subscribe to my channel and click that little bell icon so you won't miss the next video and the next episodes. Thanks!